good evening everyone and welcome to church tonight. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, tonight we're starting our new series, Resurrection, and this is happening in the lead up to Easter. We're going to be focusing on the story of Jesus' death, his burial and his resurrection. And we know that this account of Jesus, it's known all over the world, not just by Christians, but by non-Christians as well. But the focus for um, us on Easter, it's not just Jesus' death. But it's the fact that he is risen, and that is what is so important. And so the Apostle Paul refers to this as the gospel, the good news that is the hope of all humanity. And so what, before we start, why don't we just quickly pray and invite the Lord to be with us tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your love in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your presence, Lord, with your people, hearing your word. We just ask now that you would make it come alive to us and that we would understand and realize the importance, oh God, of your death on the cross, how it applies to us, Lord, and what we need to do in return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we mentioned this week, um, week one, is we're going to talk about the symbol of death. And so if you would turn with me, we're going to read a, a lengthy chapter, a lengthy passage here um, from Mark chapter 15 and starting at verse 22, Mark 15 and 22, talking about Jesus' crucifixion. It says, And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. It's an amazing passage and we could stop and, and pull apart so many different parts of that and look at them in detail because it can just be easy to gloss over exactly what happened when Jesus was crucified and just skip straight to the resurrection and the victory of that. But the reality is that Jesus died an excruciating death. In fact, that's where we get the word excruciating from crucifixion, which was the worst kind of death that a person could suffer, the most torturous death. And all of this was for our sake. The cross, it was a wooden tree and its purpose was for executing the worst prisoners. And it was a symbol of death for thieves and for murderers and all the worst kinds. And this is the method of execution that they used to kill the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Now we know while his experience on the cross was terrible, Jesus also suffered horribly in the lead up to the cross. We know that he was tried and unjustly condemned. And after this, he was scourged. 
Now, I don't know if you know much about what the Romans used to do to their prisoners, but the scourging post was two feet high and the prisoner had their wrists firmly shackled to the iron rings so they, they couldn't stand up, they were hunched over. And then their clothing was ripped away so that they stood naked. And then the Roman soldiers would come in and do, literally this is what they did for a living. And they were so accustomed to this brutal art that they could beat a victim until only just the barest spark of life remained. They knew exactly how far to go just so that there was a little bit of life left. And so they would use this short-handled whip and it consisted of several thin iron chains which ended in weights and these would just flay the skin off the back. And they actually referred to scourging as little death and it was used to precede the big death, which was crucifixion. Now under Hebrew law, a man was only allowed to be whipped 39 times. That was it, you could not whip them anymore. That was the limit set by the law. But Roman punishment had no limit on the number of times that a person could be whipped. The only rule was that the prisoner was not allowed to die before they could be crucified. And so this was, uh, I don't know how long this went on for, but they would have enjoyed this process, I'm sure. They did it many times. And once the scourging was finished, the limp body of the victim was cut away from the post. And they would wash his wounds, but there was no medication given because shortly they would die anyway. It's, it's a terrible thing and it's hard to even talk about thinking that Jesus went through this for us. And so after this, they would take the prisoner and they would parade him along to the execution ground. And so they would, uh, it would be a long, slow parade along the public streets and really this was designed to serve as a warning to others and to demonstrate just how powerful Rome was and how much authority it had over the people. And this, this was a death meant for the worst of criminals, for the lowest of the low. Um, and it, this form of punishment was meant to deter crime and I'm sure it did a really great job of that. No one wanted to go through this kind of death. And so when they would parade them through the streets, they would always have a sign that would be carried before the condemned man telling them what he had done. And then they would place this sign on the cross. And we know from our reading that Jesus' inscription, which was written in Greek and Latin and Hebrew, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And so this long, slow parade would end at the foot of the cross. And this cross was actually made up of two separate pieces. There was a vertical piece and that was firmly fixed into the ground. And this piece would be reused many times for many different criminals, many different people being executed. But as they would parade uh, through the streets, the condemned man was forced to carry the horizontal, the, the crossbar piece on his back. And this would have weighed about 50 kilos. And you think this man's just been whipped, he's been beaten and flayed, and yet he has to carry that rough cross with the splinters digging into his back, which is already a mess. And so um, he carried that. One of the accounts tells us that someone else ended up having to carry Jesus' cross because he was in such a weak and poor physical condition that he couldn't do it. And so here he comes, and the Roman soldiers drive the nails into Jesus' hands and then into that wooden beam. And then they place that wooden beam with the full weight of Christ's body suspended from the nails. They lift that and they drop it into place on the vertical portion of the cross. They flex his knees, they place his right foot over his left and they drive a spike into the soft tissues between the metatarsal bones of his feet. So Jesus is now suspended on the cross and his arms formed a V as his body sagged and his entire body weight was supported by those nails. And when you look at what happens when someone hangs on a cross, they, they're suffering excruciating pain in their arms. And, and because of this, their muscles start to spasm. And this a muscle spasming elevates the rib cage, meaning that it's really impossible for them to breathe out. 
And so they can only take in really tiny volumes of air and then the carbon dioxide levels in the blood increase rapidly and so their shortness of breath, they can't breathe. And so to relieve this muscle spasm, to relieve this panicky feeling of the shortness of breath, the person would push themselves up on the cross. They would transfer their weight to the nail in the feet. And when they were doing this, those spasms disappeared and now they could breathe more easily. The only problem was after a short while, it was just unbearable to support yourself, your full weight on one nail in your feet. And so then you would slide back down the cross and once again just be hanging there suspended from the hands. And that rough cypress wood would have clawed at the open wounds on Jesus' back as he moved up and down on the cross. And this agonising cycle was repeated again and again until Jesus just no longer had the strength to raise himself up on the cross. And finally, at 3pm, he finally died of asphyxiation or a slow suffocation. And this... This is how Jesus purchased our salvation. It's a wonderful thing. It's a terrible thing that he endured, but what a wonderful thing for us that he would love us that much, that he would do this to win us. In his book, Trusting God, Jerry Bridges puts it this way. If we want proof of God's love for us, then we must first look at the cross. Calvary is the one objective, absolute, irrefutable proof of God's love for us. Well, before Jesus was crucified and he was raised from the dead, the cross was seen as nothing more than a symbol of death. But this one event, because of his sacrifice and his resurrection, To us, the cross is now a symbol of hope and love and redemption. Well, let's go back to the beginning, I guess. Why did this happen? Why was this necessary? Why was Jesus hanging on this cross? Well, if we go all the way back to Genesis 1, it tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything within it, including humans, He placed Adam and Eve in the middle of the garden and asked them to look after it. And while they were there in the garden, they were given just one rule, one simple rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was it. And in return, they had access to all of paradise. Well, humans being humans, we always want what we can't have. And so Satan tempted Eve and she became convinced that the one thing that they could not have was the very thing that she could not live without. So Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they ate the fruit and as a result, death and sickness entered the world. Adam and Eve were banished from God's presence, from the garden and after this, life became very, very different for them. It was not the beautiful paradise that they'd had before. Now they had to work from the sweat of their brow. And so we read a little further on and they had two children, their first two children, Cain and Abel. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd and Cain became a farmer. And we're just going to read an account here in Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 to 5. And it says this, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So this is, we see here the first instance of sacrifice in scripture. Here they brought an offering to the Lord. Both of them brought an offering. But God accepted the firstborn, the best lamb of Abel, and he rejected the plants that Cain offered. Because he had already told, obviously communed with Adam and Eve and spoke to them, telling them how they should sacrifice. But this sacrifice here, it set a precedent for sacrifices to the gods with little g. (laughs) 
to all the gods. Because before long, people began to dream up gods that controlled the moon and the sun, the rain and the snow, pretty much anything you can think of, they invented a god for it. And every city had gods who did different things and everyone had to do as the city priest said to worship those gods. And so if you were living in one city and you left that city and went to another one, well, you left your gods back in that city and then you went and worshipped the gods in the new city. The only time you would keep them the same is if both cities worshipped the same god. And we, we know from history if the people wanted rain in a drought, they would sacrifice their animals. I mean, they would strip themselves naked or beat themselves with glass bottles or scratch their skin with rocks because this is what they thought made the gods listen to them. History tells us um, examples of mass suicides, cutting off appendages and burning houses just to get a god to send rain or to let the sun come up. And so the Israelites, they were products of the cultures around them in some cases. So they would follow the examples of these cultures around them. And instead of worshipping the one true God, they would fall far away from God and worship many different gods instead. I mean, the scripture tells us um, about in Genesis, sorry, in Exodus 32, where they created a golden calf to worship and said, here you go, here's your gods now, Israel, here you go. Um, And this was despite God's clear instructions that he alone was God and they were not to worship any other gods. And you can find this instruction in Exodus 20, verses 3 to 5, where it says this, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So he said, you're not going to have any other gods before me. You're not going to make yourself any carved image, any idol that looks like anything on this earth or not even on this earth. (laughs) But me, you shall worship only me. Well, In times when um, the Israelites turned from God and God allowed them to be taken captive by other nations, they would often join with those cultures in worshipping idols, bowing down before large statues of gods or even kings. And these acts involved sacrifice to gods. So we see this all through history. And God, the one true God, had a different plan for how he should be approached, but this plan also involved sacrifice. We know in Genesis 8 and 20, after the great flood, that Noah sacrificed animals to God. And when God gave Moses the law, he gave him guidelines for when and how to sacrifice animals for purification. And so you might be asking, well, why why the animals? Why are we hurting them? They didn't do anything wrong. And you're correct, they didn't. But the children of Israel had committed sin. And the punishment for sin is death. The Bible makes this very clear. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So something has to die to pay the price for sin. And so this is why God commanded his people to sacrifice that pure, innocent animal in place of themselves to purify their sin. And yeah, they did this, but soon the sacrifice became more of a ritual rather than an actual sacrifice. And then the synagogues began to come up with other rules about, uh, well, extra rules about sacrifices and, and then other ways that the children of Israel could receive forgiveness. But these animals, no matter how flawless they were, they could only temporarily cover the penalty for sins. The only thing that could once and for all settle a debt of sin was a perfect sacrifice. And that perfect sacrifice had to be God himself. God manifest in the flesh. He came to earth by way of Mary as a baby called Jesus. And when he was 30 years old, he began to perform miracles to heal people and to teach Jesus spoke to his disciples. He revealed to them and then to the world 
what becoming the ultimate sacrifice for sins of all people for all time would look like. And then at 33 years old, just three short years after revealing his true self to the people of Israel, he showed them and he showed us true love by choosing to die on the cross. Really, it's incredible to think that someone would be willing to die for you and for me because we deserve death. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be the ones hanging on that cross, suffering the death of the worst of the worst. And yet, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get forgiveness. And, you know, we've, we've looked a little bit at Jesus' physical pain, what he endured on the cross, but we haven't spoken about the other types of pain that he experienced. The emotional pain. He was mocked and taunted. The soldiers at his crucifixion jeered that he couldn't save himself, even though he was supposed to be the king of the Jews. And they spit on him and no doubt said every terrible thing imaginable. And even without the death on the cross, to be treated that way would be a terrible thing. Jesus also felt the pain of betrayal. The apostle Peter, who he'd loved and mentored for these three years, denied he even knew him. <laughs> three years, being his closest friend. I don't know the guy. And the Jewish people who Jesus had fed, he'd healed, he'd ministered to, they were the ones demanding his execution. And then worst of all, <laughs> if, if you can imagine, Jesus had to take on the weight of the sin penalty for all of history, all of mankind. The pure and holy God who never sinned, in fact, he was the absolute opposite of evil. He had to take up our sins. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 declares, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Just think about the horror of that holy God facing the worst of humanity's wickedness. I mean, you think about when you've done something wrong and how it weighs on you and the guilt and the shame that plagues you and how you think it over in your mind and go, wow, I wish I hadn't done that or I feel so terrible. He had those feelings for every possible sin for all of humanity. Hebrews 12 and 2 tells us that Jesus despised the shame of the cross because of that joy that was set before him. And so Jesus endured all of this because of his love for us, even though we are so undeserving of his sacrifice. And so this first lesson in our series tonight, this is just setting the stage for what's coming in our future lessons you know, and, and when we talk about creation and sin entering the world and all the sacrifices, I mean, it can seem quite daunting. But we have to understand how we got to this place where God saw fit to save us. It wasn't a spontaneous decision of God. It wasn't some plan he came up with on the fly. But, you know, it was in the beginning, even before the foundation of the world, God knew this was going to happen. And he made a conscious decision that he would set in a plan in motion to save all of humanity. And this is the plan that we're talking about today. The sacrificial death and the subsequent resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this account tonight, it's not just a far off story that doesn't really relate to us. No, if we look at it, we are characters in that story. <laughs> and although we're far removed from the beginning of time, although we weren't literally standing there underneath the cross as he was being crucified, we are the recipients of his ultimate grace and love through that sacrifice. Jesus suffered so that we could have a future in him. He died for us. He gave us everything so that we might have a chance at something. What a beautiful thing that is. And so whether we realize it or not, we have received grace. Every day we have, every breath we take are products of the grace of God. 
Even before we knew him, he loved us. We were deserving of death. Uh, Sorry, yeah, we were deserving of death and undeserving of his sustained blessings and goodness. And yet we can take full advantage of all that life has to offer simply because God saw fit to rescue us. But you know what? As amazing and wonderful as it is, as much as we should praise God for that, and I do, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. This grace is not just for us, it goes beyond us. (laughs) For us as Christians, we don't just receive grace, but we should also actively be giving grace. How are we applying that grace in the lives of others? How are we showing love and mercy to the least of these? We've been gifted life through grace, and really it's only fitting that we embrace the love of Christ so that we might turn around and give it back to a world that has all too little love in it. Grace has a life-changing impact, and it's waiting to be given to the ones who need Jesus. And so you could consider us to be dealers of grace, vessels of mercy, containers of love, and God is asking us to give just as he gave. So let's be intentional this week about creating habits of generosity in our daily lives, and let's actively seek moments in which we can shape the lives of those around us for the better. Yes, the cross... Jesus' crucifixion it was for our sake. But God wants all to come to repentance and to take advantage of that grace that his death and his resurrection has provided for the entire human race. What a wonderful God and a wonderful saviour. And so this is our lesson for this evening. And next week we're going to discuss Jesus' burial and how it relates to our Christian walk. So please be here for that. Don't miss it. Um, Tune in next week to hear what God has for us. But in the meantime, let's just pray and commit the rest of this evening and our week to God. Jesus, we know that salvation only comes through you. You are the only way that we can come into a right relationship with you. Lord, and so we desire, God, We desire to have, Lord, to really understand and appreciate what it is that you have done for us. Lord, that your death on the cross wouldn't just be a nice story we tell at Easter, but God, that it would be a reality, Lord, that we would truly appreciate what you went through to win our salvation and to understand, Lord, that then that requires us to also sacrifice our lives. Lord, that we would follow in your footsteps. Lord, we repent of all the things we have done wrong, all of the ways that we have hurt you, all of the sin in our lives that you had to carry to the cross. God, we thank you for your forgiveness that you have offered so freely. We're grateful for this plan of salvation. Lord, and we avail ourselves of that tonight. But God, we also pray and ask that you would be with us and help us, Lord. Help us to give that grace out to other people. Lord, not to hold it all into ourselves, but Lord, to spread the wonderful word, not just of your death on the cross, Lord, of your burial, but God, of your resurrection and of the new life that awaits for us through you, through your sacrifice and your mercy and your love. We're grateful for this tonight. We pray that you would go with us, Lord. Continue to be with us and help us, God, to be pleasing to you in all that we say and we do this week. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.